How do you build a city where even the ground can't be trusted? On a swamp of shifting mud, drowned by relentless floods, with no solid earth beneath your feet. Amsterdam is called the city that shouldn't exist. Yet today, it stands as a triumph of survival and ingenuity. Was it blind luck, a miracle of Dutch engineering, or stubbornness turned into genius? Hammering millions of wooden piles deep into the earth, raising artificial islands from waterlogged peat, reshaping nature just to stay above the tide? The answer to why they built Amsterdam on water, and how, holds the key to whether this city will survive the next flood, or if everything beneath it could finally collapse. But what secret did its first settlers discover, forcing a city to rise where no city belongs? In the 12th century, survival meant finding ground that wouldn't vanish beneath your feet. The Amstel Delta was a place where water ruled, where storms could erase a year's work in a single night. Yet, fishermen and farmers, driven from higher land by rising floods, staked their hopes on this sodden edge of Europe. They arrived with little more than their tools and the memory of drier ground. Each high tide threatened to reclaim the land, so the settlers answered with earth and sweat. They built artificial mounds, turpin, raising patches above the marsh. When the water pressed harder, they joined forces, piling up clay and reeds to form the first crude dikes. These weren't grand structures. They were desperate lines in the mud, just enough to hold back disaster for another season. The mouth of the Amstel offered both danger and promise. Here, the river met the restless Zwiedersee, the floods of 1170 had shown how quickly the sea could invade, carving a new channel and turning fields to lakes. But the same waters brought fish, trade, and the chance for a future. Families clustered on the highest ground they could make, building homes on wooden platforms, sometimes on bundles of brushwood lashed together. There was no city, only a scattering of huts and barns, each one a gamble against the next storm. Around 1270, a solution took shape. Settlers built a dam across the Amstel, right where the present-day Dam Square stands. It was a simple barrier, packed with earth and timber, but it changed everything. The dam did not just hold back the river, it made the land behind it livable. Soon, a market sprang up atop the dam, a place where fishermen sold their catch and traders bartered for goods. The name Emestella Dam, dam in a watery area, appeared in records, a promise of stability in a world ruled by water. Each new flood tested their resolve, but with every repair, every shovelful of clay, the settlement grew more real the city that shouldn't exist began as a question of survival, answered by hands willing to shape the earth, one mound, one dike, one dam at a time. By the early 1600s, Amsterdam's future depended on more than just holding back water. The city's leaders faced a riddle, how to let a settlement grow when every new street risked sinking into the marsh. Their answer was a plan as bold as it was precise. Concentric canals, drawn like ripples from a stone tossed into the center. With maps and measuring rods, municipal planners charted four great arcs. Herengracht, Kaisersgracht, Prinzengracht, and the outermost Singlegracht. Each was more than a ditch. These were engineered corridors, dug by hand and wheelbarrow designed to drain the land, carry goods, and defend the city all at once. The work began in 1613. Crews cut through peat and clay, piling earth high to create new ground where none had existed. As the canal belt advanced, the city's footprint doubled, then tripled, each phase carefully recorded in council minutes and on the maps of Balthazar van Berkenrode. 
The soil dug from the canals was hauled by barge and cart to raise the embankments, lifting new neighborhoods above the waterline. Streets took shape beside the water, wide enough for carts and lined with space for warehouses. Merchants claimed plots along the new canals, eager to load and unload cargo straight from the barges below. But water control was always the heart of the system. Every canal section was fitted with locks and sluices, wooden gates and stone chambers, built to hold back floods or release excess water when storms threatened. The outermost canal, the Singelgracht, circled the city like a moat. Drawbridges and dikes, not stone walls, kept Amsterdam safe from more than just rising water. The canals could be emptied, refilled, or sealed off, a living infrastructure that turned risk into resource. Beneath the surface, a hidden network of channels, culverts, and sluices managed the city's pulse. Water levels were adjusted daily, sometimes hourly, by teams of lock keepers. In winter, ice threatened to choke the city's arteries, so workers broke channels open, keeping trade and traffic moving. The canal belt became more than a defense. It was the framework for a city that could expand, adapt, and thrive, no matter how restless the water around it. By the end of the century, Amsterdam's canals were not just barriers or drains, they were streets of water, the veins of a city built to survive and prosper on the edge of the impossible. By the mid-1600s, Amsterdam's skyline looked nothing like the muddy village of its beginnings. Brick houses, tall and impossibly narrow, lined the new canals in orderly rows. Each one stood shoulder to shoulder, their gabled roofs and painted facades reflected in the water below. But this wasn't just a matter of taste. The city taxed homeowners by the width of their street frontage, so merchants built upward, not outward, squeezing whole families, warehouses, and counting rooms into houses barely wider than a wagon. Some facades stretched barely two meters across. Yet inside, they reached deep and climbed high stacked with goods from every corner of the globe. Amsterdam's merchant class thrived on this watery grid. Canals acted as highways, linking warehouses to the open sea. Barges carried sugar from the Caribbean, spices from Java, and furs from Russia straight to the doors of traders. The city's wealth swelled, and with it, ambition. In 1602, the Dutch East India Company set up shop here, and by 1609, the world's first stock exchange opened for business. Deals struck on the dam echoed across continents. Money, goods, and information flowed as easily as the water underfoot. Every brick, every beam rested on hidden piles and careful engineering. But above ground, Amsterdam's beauty was a public performance. Decorative gables, carved stone and iron lifting hooks turned warehouses into works of art. The city became a stage for global commerce, powered by ingenuity, ambition, and the constant, quiet labor of water. Underneath the spectacle, the real secret was the city's foundation, a hidden forest of wood and a network of canals that made everything possible. Beneath Amsterdam's brick facades and canal houses, another city waits in shadow, a layered archive of human struggle and invention. Archaeologists working along the Roken and Damrak have sifted through nearly 700,000 artifacts, each one a clue to centuries of daily life. Medieval coins, lost tools, pottery shards, even the ribs of abandoned ships, all sealed in mud, then revealed during the North-South Metro excavation. Every find is a reminder that the city stands not just on piles of timber, but on the memory of floods, repairs, and reinvention. Yet, the ground itself is shifting. Amsterdam's hidden forest of 11 million wooden piles depends on water to survive. 
As groundwater drops, drained by modern polder pumps or dry summers, oxygen creeps in. Timber that stood strong for centuries softens, crumbles, and fails. Engineers from Waternet and Reichswaterstadt race to monitor, patch, and underpin the city's foundations. Emergency repairs at landmarks like the Royal Palace and canal warehouses have become routine, their cost measured in millions. But innovation is never far behind. On the eastern edge, new neighborhoods like Eijeburg float directly on the Eijemir, anchored not by piles, but by buoyant platforms. Modern architects, inspired by the city's amphibious past, design homes that drift with the water rather than fight it. Pumping stations hum day and night, holding back the tide, while engineers test sensors and smart systems to keep groundwater stable. For every secret unearthed below, a new solution rises above, a city learning again and again how to survive on water. Amsterdam stands today on an estimated 11 million wooden piles, each driven deep through peat and clay into sand since the 14th century. What began as a fight for survival on flooded marshes led to a city engineered atop a hidden forest of timber, protected for centuries by groundwater. Historical records confirm that the 1270 dam on the Amstel was the turning point transforming a vulnerable settlement into one of the world's first global trading capitals by the 1600s. Yet even now, archaeologists continue to discover medieval artifacts and water management secrets beneath its streets, reminding us that much of Amsterdam's underworld remains uncharted. As groundwater levels drop and sea levels rise, the same ingenuity that built the city is now tasked with preserving it. The evidence is clear. Amsterdam's future, like its past, depends on relentless adaptation, proof that its true foundation is human persistence and engineering skill.